Good morning and welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Los Angeles. How is We can just keep applauding. I talked about applause last week, didn't I? A little bit with Dr. Sue. Good. Wasn't it great to have Dr. Sue here last Sunday? She's a powerhouse, just a pistol, to say the least. So, love her. You got your visa approved to be here today, Sunday morning, celebrate Center of Spiritual Living Los Angeles? Well, since we interrupted me for that, come forward so we can applaud you. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Keith. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living, the home of all with Tourette's. So, um, <laughs> so what's your name? Serena. Serena, as in Williams? Uh, kind of, yes. Serena, what's your surname? Limonta. Serena Kinda Sorbata, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So you had your visa approved, but yeah, you're... for in, three years. For three years. So I can work as an actress. An Great, actress. keep feeding me lines. I won't ask any questions. <laughs> Where am I from? We're, that's, not, that's the question. You feed me the line, and I'll ask you the question. There we go. Say, I'm from... I'm from Italy. Italy. <laughs> parla italiano, si. Sí. <laughs> parla italiano, si. Sí. Bueno, bueno. Bravo. Oh, yes, yes. Well, welcome. Okay, leave, Thank I'll you, leave. yes. It's a new day. I shared my stage early, right? My Bima, good. So anyway, <laughs> on this laid back, easy Sunday morning, easy like Sunday morning. We've got great musicians today. Stuart Elster's here with us on keyboards. <laughs> the one and only producer, director, did I find that out? This composer, um, jackass of all trades, not jackass, jackass of all trades. <laughs> Andrew Belling, <laughs> he shied away. And the infamous and famous one and only Gaia Zule on percussion. And I'm Keith Cox, your spiritual leader. Interesting title, right? Well, we come together every Sunday morning to spend about 54 minutes in applause and the total of an hour and six minutes hearing and knowing the truth for ourselves. There's something rattling in the back that sounds like a rattlesnake, but I think it's Jesus expressing himself with a very small rhythm instrument. So, um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we do come together on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. to honor the uniqueness that is each and every one of you um, and who you are as a spiritual being and celebrate you on your journey of spiritual awakening and in so doing hope and to know for each and every one of you that you find your personal self-empowerment. That's the reversed aspect of our vision statement, which is finding personal self-empowerment through a spiritual awakening. We teach preach, practice, and know primarily the teachings of the science of mind, which is a book that was written in a philosophy by Dr. Ernest Holmes, published in the early 1900s. It's known in its modern context as a philosophy, a faith, and a way of life. We welcome all aspects of life, all religions, all countries of origin, even Italians, all sexual orientations, all genders, even Italians, all ethnicities, all abilities, all aspects of life, we celebrate you and stand with you. As our beloved Dr. Walker used to say, whether you're here in person or online joining us today, we Welcome all. So on that note, let's say hello to those that are watching us online. Hello, onlineers. Come on in, Philip Nimmo and Edward Brown. We've got a chilled, laid-back kind of um, family type of service today. So come on in. So we open our Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, with a ritual. It's an opportunity for us to anchor ourselves into the knowing of who we are as spiritual beings and the oneness of all light. It's a ritual that encompasses both the spoken word, affirmation, acknowledgement of light itself by lighting a candle, song, a song which allows you to do call and response, and the last piece of it is a spiritual mind treatment or also known as affirmative prayer. If you're new to that concept, it's praying in a way through a declaration um, and declaring that which is true about us, not supplication at all. And so if you're new to it, open your, I invite you to open your mind. The practitioner of the day usually takes us through that process, and that will be the case today as well. 
Farrell, and I am your practitioner of the day. Our illuminator is the one and only Wendy Warris, and we're happy to have her here today. So Wendy, come on up and light them. And our musicians are going to take us through the song, so um, I invite you to take a moment and just look within. There's ten. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that may be one more than you need, but we'll see. Let's see if I can incorporate it. Oh, wow. Well, you know what? We can't really count that early in the morning. But there again, it's kind of a roll with the kind of Sunday morning thing. So let's see how it goes, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the ritual that we perform this morning and every Sunday morning is called Calling in the Light. We perform this ritual to promote the universal consciousness of life, which acknowledges that all people and all faiths, all sentient beings come from the one all-abiding presence, which we call spirit. The purpose of this ritual is to draw into our gathering this morning a conscious awareness of our oneness and the qualities that we possess as complete expressions of the divine. Wendy lights the first candle for the quality of peace. In this way, we honor our inherent divine state of inner calm regardless of any seeming chaos unfolding around or within us. The second candle is illuminated for the quality of power. The power we acknowledge as the energy by which every single thing exists. The third candle is lit for the quality of beauty. Beauty is known in our philosophy and teaching as a personal expression by which high spiritual qualities are made manifest. As Wendy illuminates the fourth candle, she does so for the quality of joy, that state of being that is excited by the expectancy and the experience of good. Good, in our teaching, is a synonym for God. As Wendy lights the fifth candle, she does so for the quality of light, the symbol of divine intelligence. As we move to the sixth candle, it's lit for the for life, the quality of life. Life in this philosophy is known as the animating principle of being, that inner something that makes everything live. The seventh candle is lit for the quality of love. Love in our teaching is defined as the self-givingness of spirit, the desire of life to express itself by giving of itself. The eighth candle is lit for the quality of wisdom. Defined as the concept of unity in the mystical secret of the ages. Our ninth candle that we light today is for our ability to be grateful. Just take a moment and feel the energy of gratitude, which is considered to be one of the most transformative qualities that exist. And we move to the final candle, the tenth candle, which is known as the healing candle. And I ask you to take a moment and think of someone that you would like to silently put into the light of the healing flame to experience the eternal and everlasting love of the divine. I am love. I am love. I am I am peace in my heart, in my heart. I am free. I am free. I am. Spirit. 
that which we have placed into the law of life is reflecting its true nature of peace, power, beauty, joy, light, life, love, wisdom, gratitude, and healing. What I know for each of us today, whether we're online watching this live or later or here in the room, feeling the energy of transformation, is that we take a moment and are grateful for the opportunity to A, feel, B, to know. C, to co-create. D, to receive. And E, to heal. Which is a reflection of the interconnectedness of that which exists and expresses itself by means of each one of us. And so we allow this service to unfold together today, our celebration service, by continuing to celebrate life itself, by celebrating the opportunity to come together and acknowledge the aspects of life, the outpicturing of life that has taken place by means of each one of us and just simply life itself. We have called in the light and we let it guide us. And we let it be as we say together. And so it is. But thank you, Wendy. Stuart, Andy, Guy. And thank you to each of you. So we're so happy, um, and I say we, meaning all of us that are here, and I speak on the collective we, to have Stuart back with us today. So, Stuart, they, I heard many as they walked in today clapping when they saw you at the piano, and that's a rare thing here. So, no, it's a good thing. First off, we've established that we like applause here, so that's a good thing, and that you have the consciousness to draw it out of people, so that's an even better thing. If you're here experiencing Stuart for the first time, um, open yourselves up to some amazing um, artistry on the beautiful black and whites right there known as the keyboard. So, um, as I've said before, Stuart has a gig every Sunday morning, and he um, leaves that one to come be with us when he's here, and it's a real pleasure to have him here along with Andy Belling and Guy Azule. Enjoy.
Stuart Elster, Andy Ballin, and Guy Azule. I was right, right? Very special, thank you. So as Stuart said, for those of you that could, if you couldn't hear him, that the theme today is about love. It's about love. This past week, I um, officiated a wedding. And it was one that there was a lot of um, challenge along with the spontaneity of creating it, let's just say. Um, lots of scheduling that needed to get moved around and lots of different, it, it was just a lot, let's just put it that way. And um, it was a little bit on my nerves, that piece of it. So um, I'll just say, I'm human, right? 98% of the time. And so, um, <laughs> And there were, seemed to be a, a lot of parties involved in setting it all up for a wedding of six people. Um, but it came together, and um, it was this really magical, magical, magical experience. And as I stood with the two grooms um, officiating this wedding, um, that once, once again came together like that, and um, both physically was beautiful, emotionally was beautiful, but as I stood and felt the presence of those that were in this intimate environment and watched these two gentlemen look into each other's eyes, it became very apparent to me right away that what we were celebrating that evening was not only the love of two humans that were being, that are attracted to one another and that was ready to make a commitment to one another, um, for whatever period of time that commitment needs to be made. Um, but that the love that was both being felt and exchanged and experienced and expressed during this time that we were together transcended the human experience. The love that was there in that time together was palpable. It, it was beyond hormonal even though the hormones were there. It was beyond romance, and it was beyond oftentimes that which is explainable. And yet, in our philosophy, we talk about it as being explainable all the time. It's the self-givingness of spirit whose desire is to create more of itself out of itself. And I left there that evening and the next day just really processing that, that um, what does it feel like, not only in that particular moment, to have experienced love in that way, but is it possible for each and every one of us to have love that is transcendent of the human experience, not negating the human experience, but incorporating the human experience of divine love as a common denominator for life itself and as we maneuver and experience life? And so I chose today that our theme for the day would indeed be love as an invitation for each of you to open your mind and your heart and your soul and your being to a greater acceptance of the self-givingness of spirit that exists within us already that is calling forth, it's beckoning from within us to express more of itself. And the only way it can do that is through itself. And as a result of that, when we listen and say yes to that which exists within us, then that which is transcendent becomes visceral in our life and the mirror of life that is always working to us and through us and for us brings back into our field of experience that which it is. I, in processing that, I came up with an acronym for the word love. And it's going to be the basis from which I approach love today, transcending human love. Now, we all know what human love feels like, or love with our dog, or love with our cat, or whatever it is that we experience love with. But beyond that, in the terms of divine love, and it's this, life's one vital energy. L-O-V-E, life's one vital energy. And I'm again by reading some lyrics from a, one of the 800 songs that Stuart referenced being written about love. And I'm sure you know the title, but I'm going to see if you can figure it out once I read them to you. Who knows what tomorrow brings in a world few hearts survive. All I know is the way I feel when it's real I keep it alive. 
The road is long, there are mountains in our way, but we climb a step every day. Love lifts us up where we belong. Where the eagles cry on a mountain high, love lifts us up where we belong. Far from the world below, up where the clear winds blow, some hang on to used to be, live their lives looking behind. All we have is here and now, all our lives out there to find. Love lifts us up to where we belong. Life's one vital energy lifts us up where we belong. Well, where do we belong? As conscious, awakened metaphysicians, where we belong is in a place where we are consciously aligned with the vital energy whose nature is perfection, its wholeness, its completeness, its boundless, its infinite, its pure. And it's who you are. And it's who I am. And that is our truth. But so often we forget that. And we get caught up in the aspect of wanting to have someone love us or beat ourselves up because we don't love ourselves enough from a human perspective, not realizing and understanding that the way to experience the love of the human is by tapping into and revealing that life's one vital energy consciously that already is there. It's by getting rid of all of the other and allowing that to rise up and express itself through us that will attract back into our world more of that which is. But if we're not congruent with who we are as divine beings, then we're not placing clarity, a clarity of acceptance, a clarity of knowing who we are, a clarity of understanding how life itself works, right? And then what we're bringing back into our field of experience is that which is contrary to our divine nature. Anyone ever had an experience of attracting into your world something that's contrary to your divine nature? Yeah, we don't need to go into examples of that because I'm sure we've all had them and I could tell stories that might curl your hair. But I'm not going to out myself as an undefined being right now. So continuing with this pattern, there's a quote that I am going to read to you that comes from a writing that I forgot to write down the name of the author. So let's just pretend that I called their name out. And this article talks about this concept of opening up. And here's what the author wrote. Here's a quote I love from an 18th century mystical poet, William Blake. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man, meaning that which is expressed as male, female, everything in between and beyond, for man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to the human as it is, infinite. For the human has closed themselves up till they see all things through narrow chinks of their cavern. Now those of a certain age, like me, will remember the words doors of perception. Anyone in here remember those doors, those, that line? As a catchphrase of the 1960s, first British author Alias Huxley borrowed The Doors of Perception as the title for a brief book he wrote in 1954, detailing when taking the psychedelic drug mescaline. Don't need to know who's done it, who hasn't, all right? Trust me, no judgment or celebration, all right? A decade later, the iconic rock band The Doors, we all remember The Doors, right? Borrowed their name and all the rich layers of associated meaning from Huxley's book title. As William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. Our connection to the infinite has always beckoned us. We've only to move beyond the barriers we ourselves have created to a blissful and empowering view of reality. So are you willing to allow that doorway to be cleansed and those barriers removed. And so oftentimes we are aware of the barriers that are preventing us from not only experiencing life as it is, as infinite, 
But there are many times that we're not even aware of the barriers that exist because they're deeply rooted within our psyche and our soul based on both the consciousness of all of consciousness itself or based on beliefs that have been placed within us prior to our becoming aware that we had the ability to be aware of the awareness that's creating the experiences that we're having in life. And yet, we have the ability and the capacity to cleanse the doors, to cleanse them with or without mescaline. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but what I am saying to you is within us, separate from any chemical insertion or application, we have the ability to cleanse that which has created a barrier for us between us and what we perceive the divine to be. And the first step to that is shifting our belief that we are indeed divine. And that the wholeness and the completeness and the perfection of the divine that exists in all of its totality exists within you and within me in all of its totality. This writing goes on to say that in most recent explorations of what the infinite means to us, this individual has been reading a book called The Impersonal Life by Joseph S. Benner. According to Benner, every one of us has both a personal self as well as an impersonal aspect to our being. Your personal self or your personality, if you will, is being directed at all times by your mind and your five and or sometimes believed to be six or seven senses. When you approach your life from your impersonal self, it is an opportunity to free yourself now and forever from the unhealthy and limiting dominion of your personality with its self-inflated and often self-sabotaging mind and intellect. Now, so often in this teaching, and certainly in the 20th century version of this, we were taught to believe that it was our intellect that was going to guide us into the ultimate expression of who we are as divine beings. And yet, what I believe to be the case is it's our intellect that actually is the tool or the guide to move us to the place so that we can transcend our intellect and allow the deep knowing that is within us to rise up and express itself, and it's from that process. It's from that journey that we indeed find our personal self-empowerment through a spiritual awakening. But we only get to find that personal self-empowerment through a spiritual awakening by having the spiritual awakening. And the spiritual awakening is not going to come from the intellect. The spiritual awakening is going to come from that which is deeper and deeper and deeper than where the intellect resides. It's from that place that we find through meditation. It's from that place where we allow ourselves to listen. It's from that place where we close our mind off and receive. But so often we're scared of that which is going to show up when we receive. But I encourage you today to open yourself up to the connection of your infinite and know that it is indeed beckoning you. It always has and it always will. And for that to happen, I encourage you to create some practice in your life, whether it's each and every day or ten times a day, to stop and ask yourself, who am I? We did that in our meditation this morning. To ask ourselves, who am I? And allow the answer of that to rise up and tell you. And ask yourself, do you know yourself to be loved? Do you know yourself to be powerful? Do you know yourself to be complete? Do you know yourself to be perfection? Do you know that within you is the power that you've always had? I spoke of it two weeks ago. When Glinda, the good witch, told Dorothy, you've always had the power, my dear. You've just had to learn it for yourself. Well, the key to experiencing more and more of the divineness of who you really are, who you've always been, who you always will be, who is the true you, is to know more and more and more, day by day by day, week by week by week, life by life, that the power that is within you that will reveal itself is already there. You have to do nothing to bring it forward, but yet you get to experience and express more and more and more of it. It is life's one vital energy beckoning you to let it express itself through you. 
Dr. Sue told us last week to maneuver life by saying, within me, I am the fountain of life, and by my light do I see light. You guys remember her telling us to do that? That's a practice to do that, to know for ourselves that within me that I am the fountain of life itself. I am the fountain of love. I am the fountain of life's one vital energy. And by allowing that fountain to flow through my flow of life's one vital energy, do I experience and express more of that which it is. I don't have to create it. I don't have to ask for it. I don't have to summon it. And I don't have to wait for some outside deity to bless me for it to be there. I just have to simply let it be that which it is and let it out. And then let it out. And let it out. And let it out. Now what we know in this teaching is the more and the more and the more that we set it free and let it out, is that we're creating a vibrational frequency, a life, a reverberance, if you will, around us that because we live in a world that's governed by spiritual law will attract back to us more of that which it is. And as we bring it in, we just, we get to bless it. We don't ask for some power outside of us to bless it. We get to bless it, which then builds our consciousness. And in building our consciousness, what takes place is a newfound state of mind aligned with its divine nature, and the fountain flows even greater, attracting more and more and more of that which it is. I'd like to read to you a quote from the Bible that addresses love's one vital energy known as love. Life's one vital energy known as love. And it's from 1 Corinthians, and I read it Wednesday night in the ceremony, and it's this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant and it's not rude. Life's one vital energy, love, does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrong, but rejoices in right. Love Life's one vital energy bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. In a word, three things hold true. Faith, hope, and love. Now, some of you may be these old school metaphysicians that you bristle at the word hope. But what's being told here is that it's important to know as we journey on our life of finding our personal self-empowerment through a spiritual awakening, is that 1 Corinthians is telling us here that what holds truth in life is faith. Now, my acronym for faith is a full assurance in the heart, meaning that as we live from a place of believing that love, life's one vital energy, is our nature, and the more that we experience and express of itself, it must multiply itself, because we've been told by Ernest Holmes that its definition is that love, life's one vital energy's nature, is to give of itself, to create out of itself more of that which is, and the only way it can do it is through you and through me. And if it's doing that already through you and through me, and it's beckoning for more to do more of that through us, it seems to me as awakened beings that know that we have the capacity to know that we know and to use this power in a way that brings us good, then what we do is open the floodgates to that which it is to let more of it out in life. And to start right now. And to then know that we must have faith that when we do that, We're not scaring away people, we're attracting them in. Not necessarily because we're looking to attract in people, but we're looking to attract in our world or more and more and more of that which we are, and in so doing, manifesting, demonstrating, creating a life that is reflective of our nature, and in so doing, life gets better and better and better. Sounds like a good plan to me. How about you? good. So what Joe Dispunza tells us in this concept is to know that if you put your energy and your attention on a relationship with the divine, then as your attention on it expands, there should be more of its intelligence available to you in its life. In other words, what we're being told here is that the love of life that is ours to focus on is the love of the divine. And in so doing, should we desire to experience more human love, it must come to us. 
as opposed to focusing on human love, hoping that we get more of that, and in so doing, we'll know who we are as a divine being in a greater way. We're being told by all the sages, all the smart ones, all the ones that's practiced this, that says, no, baby cakes, you got it in reverse. The way to do it is to focus on your divine love. And in focusing on your love as the divine, divine love, then what must multiply in your world is human love. It's by focusing on that which exists within you already that you create the shift in your field of experience, in other words, your human life. There's an article that addresses this that I think is so fantastic that is written as this, divine love versus human love. Which one should you be after? And this is written by Silva Itzak. Too many people today are concerned with chasing human love. It's happening everywhere around us. For instance, ask yourself how many movies you've seen about finding your soulmate. How many songs have we heard? How many books have we read? Right? Finding the ideal mate seems to be important, right? But, this is the, but is it really this important, she writes. Is it really worth spending your entire life's energy on that goal only? And I'm sure many of us said in the stage of our life that's not our only goal, but we may have been there, or we may still want that in life. She says, I believe it's not. I believe your main focus should be elsewhere. Don't get me wrong, Sylvia writes, there's nothing wrong with finding your twin soul, but your main concern in your spiritual evolution should be trying to experience divine love. She goes, well, let me explain why. The humankind as a whole has forgotten the true meaning of the word love. This word has been used and abused so much that sadly, many people never really find out what true divine love is. In this writing, she says, I will try to describe the main qualities and differences of human and divine love. The most fundamental feature of divine love is that it tends to transcend itself. In other words, it has a strong urge to overcome itself, which in turn leads to an equally strong word, urge for creation. Where have we heard that before? Ernie, right? Divine love, love, the self-givingness of spirit whose desire is to create more of itself out of itself. In other words, what we're being told here is we as humans don't do the creation. We know we're co-creators, but that which we co-create with is the oneness of life itself and its qualities are love and love's qualities is being called forth, love as itself, life's one vital energy to create, she goes on to write. So, so many times she says, that I've experienced this on a small scale, right? Knowing that divine love, we, that, that's why we say divine love, nothing would be created, nothing. She goes, so many times I've experienced this on a small scale in my life. Whenever I feel the energy of love, I'm inspired as I was Monday night, Tuesday night. I have a strong urge to create something beautiful. If at the same time, this also means that the key of spiritual development is having and experiencing divine love. She writes, if you want to know if you are making any progress on your spiritual path, ask yourself whether you're experiencing divine love. But divine love can only be realized if we've become one with, ver with the very stream of life itself, with the river, if you will, of universal life. The greatest thing a person can experience is their unity with the divine. That's the most perfect love the one and only kind of love every single person on this planet is looking for. The divine love has enormous power of attraction. But at the same time, it's also a balancing force that brings harmony inside of us, harmony with other people around us, and harmony with nature and with the divine. The divine love seeks no object to express itself. However, in human love terms, it's quite contrasting to the divine. Human love is possessive. It is directed towards the object of our love. If there is a certain object, say a person or a thing, that we direct our love towards, we step out of the river of love, that's what she's calling the flow, and put an end to the process of our own transcendence. Human love demands to receive, to get something in return. She writes, whenever I'm feeling human love, it's never self-sufficient. 
For while I'm able to express love, I'm doing that only if certain conditions are fulfilled. For example, that my partner behaves in a certain way. If something isn't self-sufficient, it can't be divine because it's based on separation, duality, and limitations. I, mine, me, I want, I need, I like, I have, I don't have, those were the phrases that this individual tend to use often every time they're not feeling the love of the divine in their life. Key points to keep in mind between the, in the difference between human and divine love. Divine love is all-encompassing. It has no beginning, no end, and is everlasting. When you experience divine love, you'll see no difference between a flower and a dog, between one human being and another. True love can grow only in deep meditation or in true prayer of love and kindness. Once experienced, the divine love will lead us to ever higher realms of life as the eternal. The divine love stands behind all fatherly love, all gentle motherly love, and it is the most desired love of the lovers. The divine love is joyous because it gives, and it is what it is. Now, your ego is constantly looking for a chance to derail you from the path of divine love. And unless you've managed to rise up above the illusion, self-deception, and false love of the ego, you won't stand a chance to continue and get into the flow of the divine. So the conclusion is, can you love a person in a divine way? Sure, you can. But then you'll have to love the divine in them, not themselves as much. And you'll have to give that individual total freedom. And you won't expect anything in return. And you won't ever feel disappointed, angry, betrayed, sad, or hurt in any way because something went the way you hadn't expected or approved. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference, she writes. Love is the very essence of the divine in you, and it sees the divine in others. In closing, I want to read a writing that I read at every single wedding ceremony that I do. And I love doing wedding ceremonies. Not a big fan of funerals like wedding ceremonies. And it's from the book Gifts of the Sea by Anne Morrow Lindbergh. And it's talking about love. And I invite you to listen to it as it's being written to you that when she says, when you love someone, who you're talking to is yourself. And I'm reading it to you today from the perspective and with the instruction and the invitation that you open yourselves up to be receptive to the love of the divine, life's one vital energy in a new way today. And then expand on that tomorrow. And then expand on that the next day and the next day and the next day from the perspective and for the purpose that you commit and make a covenant with living more as the divine within you and becoming not only sufficient as the self of the divine as you express yourself in life, but from the perspective of developing a consciousness that you know 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 that all is well always. Here is what she writes. When you love someone, you do not love them all the time in exactly the same way from moment to to moment. Remember, we're talking about yourself. It's an impossibility. It's even a lie to pretend to. And yet, this is exactly what most of us demand. We have so little faith in the ebb and flow of life, of love, of relationships. We leap at the flow of the tide and resist terror its ebb. We are afraid it will never return. We insist on permanency, on duration, on continuity, when the only continuity possible in life as in love is in growth, in fluidity, in freedom, in the sense that the dancers are free, barely touching as they pass, but partners in the same pattern. The only real security is not in owning or possessing, not in demanding or expecting, not in hoping even. Security in a relationship lies neither in looking back to what was in nostalgia, not forward to what might be in dread or anticipation, but living in the present and accepting it as the now. Today I encourage you to accept 
yourself in the now. And to let go of anything that took place prior to now in human terms, whether it's nostalgic or not, or with dread. Let go of what is to come from this moment forward and just live in the now. By living in the now and opening yourself up to life's one vital energy, you immediately fall into the river of love itself the river of spirit, the river of you, and the river of me. And not only do you benefit from letting go of what is, what was, but the rest of us benefit as well. Today is the day that you get to decide how much you use life's one vital energy. Thank you.